He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora, ko William Ray tēnei, no mai ki te hipi pāngo. Hi there, I'm William Ray. Welcome to Black Sheep. This is the second in a two-part series on Frederick Manning, one of the first judges on the native land court who came to Aotearoa in the early 1830s to live among Māori and Hokianga. In the process of working on the story, we reached out to several members of Te Hikutu, the hapu Manning spent the most time living with, and to some of Manning's descendants. Those I spoke to said they either didn't know enough of the history to speak about it, or simply didn't want to talk about it on tape. So I'm sorry that those perspectives aren't included in this podcast. In the winter of 1867, a series of storms pounded Hawke's Bay. Hillsides collapsed, rivers burst their banks and tore across the landscape. We've sadly seen something similar recently with Cyclone Gabrielle in February 2023. By the first week of June, the rains had subsided, and a reporter for the Hawke's Bay Herald climbed Mataruaho, the hill overlooking Napier, and looked out over the surrounding plains. Where smiling paddocks lately greeted the eye, nothing was to be seen but a waste of waters, relieved only by the settlers' houses and the clumps of trees which indicated the site of a homestead. Here and there were houses which the water had not reached, but these, we regret to say, were the exception rather than the rule. But where some saw devastation, others saw opportunity. The flooding had dramatically changed the course of the Ngaruroro River. Now it ran more directly out to sea, draining what had once been a boggy wetland at the Hiratonga Plain and forming a dry, fertile grassland. Eventually it would become the site of modern-day Hastings. A handful of rich settlers had already been leasing some of this land from Ngāti Kahungunu to graze their sheep. Now they aimed to purchase the Hiratonga outright. But, standing in their way, was a small group of Māori. Ten men who'd been granted legal title to that whenua by the Native Land Court. Theoretically, these men were supposed to act like trustees, holding the rights to the land on behalf of their wider iwi, which had lived on this whenua for generations. But in practice, if any of these men decided to sell the land, nobody in their iwi had the legal power to stop them. It was a weakness in the law, and to exploit that weakness, this group of settlers formed what historians call a purchase ring. As University of Auckland Emeritus Professor Dr David Williams explains, this particular purchase ring became known as the Twelve Apostles. That was a reference to the fact one of its members was the son of an Anglican bishop. Uh, You've got a member of the provincial council, you've got a surveyor, you've got a pub keeper, you've got a a storekeeper, um, and so on. And Māori are encouraged to run up debts in these uh, various establishments. And at some point, the purchase ring says, well, look, we've uh, run out of patience. Uh, We're now going to uh, ask you to pay up your debt. Oh, well, hang on, I just... uh, just wait a sec. No, 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 not wait a sec. We'll do it straight away. Uh, that survey over there, he'll go and survey out a block of land which we think will cover the costs of those uh, bills that you've run up. And these sales weren't just a few acres here and there. The Hiratonga block was 19,000 acres. And within just three years, 17,000 acres of that land was sold to the apostles. Virtually the whole of northern and central Hawke's Bay Uh, had been sold within a very, very short period of time, three or four years, leaving Māori virtually landless. These sales quickly became a major scandal among Māori and some Pākehā. In 1872, 554 Māori signed a petition to Parliament demanding something be done. It said, The storekeepers urged the grantees to sell the portions for which they were trustees for others. The sale was urged before the grantees were aware of what they were doing. Consequently, they sold for a small price. A commission of inquiry was launched with four commissioners. 
Tu were Māori, Wiramu Te Fioro, a respected Waikato rangatira, and the Ngāti Rangiwewehi leader, Wiramu Hikairo. The other two were judges on the Native Land Court, Charles Richmond, a former Native Affairs Minister, and our black sheep, Frederick Manning. The evidence at this inquiry was pretty scandalous. One man had been pushed to sell to pay debts he'd partly incurred fighting in the New Zealand wars alongside the Crown. He'd bought supplies for his men on credit, but the government had refused to reimburse him. Another man was chased so relentlessly by land buyers, he'd once climbed a tree to escape them. There were also stories of Māori selling land to pay for fancy clothes, horses and other luxuries. In the settler press, there's a great deal of derogatory comment on Māori, who engaged with the Pākehā way of life in quite grand ways at times. But the other side of that very same coin uh, is that this was a deliberate process of encouraging Māori to own racehorses, to bet on racehorses, to have large um, celebrations with lots of alcohol supplied and to run up um, very significant debts with the specific purpose of um, acquiring the land uh, through the land court uh, after a sufficient amount of debt had been incurred. There was a lot of evidence that Māori was supplied with alcohol while negotiating land sales and the chair of the inquiry noted that in all the cases which had come before the commission, he had not found a single instance in which a native making a bargain had had the assistance of a solicitor. But the commission ultimately concluded the Hiratonga purchases hadn't broken any laws and the buyers shouldn't be forced to hand the land back. There were missionaries like Grace and others that uh, spoke out against this, and there were one or two South Island politicians who are very critical of the land-greedy policies of the North Island uh, politicians. There was debate on these things. Um, It wasn't just uh, one policy that everyone agreed with, but if you look at the outcomes at the end of the day, very little by way of uh, retention uh, of whenua in the hands of Māori. But while some criticised the unethical behaviour of these purchases and the failure of the government to protect Māori interests, Frederick Manning wasn't among them. In the final paragraph of his report into the Heretonga sales, Manning said, The state of things now exhibited in Hawke's Bay is, I believe, the natural and inevitable consequences of the contact of the two races. One possessed of capital, science, laborious energy, provident, far-sighted, acquisitive and tenacious, the other untaught, inexperienced in the new social conditions which are growing up around him, eager for the present possession of property, devoted to the gratification of the passing day. All that can be done is to give the natives a fair opportunity to avail themselves of the benefits of civilization, which are now placed within their reach, and if they abandon or neglect this opportunity, to leave them to the event. In a private letter to a Pākehā friend in Hokianga, Manning's attitude was even more callous. You should see here stolid ignorance, pampered, truculent, conceited narcissism, hungering and thirsting after our wealth for themselves, too lazy to create it, envying us, but fortunately, to a certain degree, fearing us. Every time I read something like this from Frederick Manning, it comes as a shock. There's a sense of whiplash seeing these words from the same man we met in our previous episode, living among Tihikutu in Hokianga. He very much inserted himself and was accepted into the local society, the local family group. This is John Nicholson. He's a descendant of Frederick Manning's younger brother. John grew up hearing stories of his ancestor and would later write a biography about him. He became good friends with a a young, up-and-coming, high-ranking man, uh, Hauraki and and his sister Moangaroa, with whom he fell in love, got married uh, within the Māori tradition. Even in the 1860s, when Manning was privately calling for war against Māori who opposed colonisation, he was also writing fondly about his early years living among Māori in Hokianga. In the opening lines of his memoir, Old New Zealand, he said, 
Ah, those good old times when first I came to New Zealand. We shall never see the lake again. Since then, the world seems to have gone wrong somehow. A dull sort of world, this now. The very sun does not seem to me to shine as bright as it used. Pigs and potatoes have degenerated, and everything seems flat, stale, and unprofitable. Part of this was probably just regular old nostalgia, but it was true, Aotearoa really had changed. Just five years after the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi, war had come to Northland. In 1845, an alliance of Ngāpuhi Hapu, led by Honeheke and Tsiruki Kawati, repeatedly chopped down the flagstaff at Kororareka and then raided the town itself. The intent was to push back British encroachment on Māori land and mana, something the Brits had promised wouldn't happen in Te Tiriti o Waitangi. But this wasn't as simple as Māori versus the British. There were a complex series of struggles between two Māori factions, as well as with the Redcoats. Many hapū would either remain neutral or take up arms to fight Heke and his allies, hoping to preserve peaceful trade with Pākehā, and in some cases to settle scores with rival hapū. Manning would later claim he had a central role in convincing huge numbers of Hokianga Māori to join the British side. But as Te Rarawa Komatua Hami Pirapi explained last episode, Manning often exaggerated his influence among Māori. I'm sure he, he would have considered himself to be in a privileged position to be delivering advice. But delivering advice and having res- advice received and responded to is something else. And I don't think much of his advice was ever received and responded to um, positively. John Nicholson, though, says Frederick Manning was involved in the war as a supplier of arms and ammunition, and also fought personally. He gets involved himself in a couple of the actions. The first one he goes to is he's involved in a little bit of the skirmishing, and then he goes home again. After that, it seems that he he's a little bit aloof from the action. He's He stays on the sidelines and, and uses his skills as a marksman to provide, you know, supporting fire. Through the sights of his rifle, Frederick Manning had a chance to witness one of the most dramatic and, for the British, most devastating moments of the Northern War. It started in June 1845. Honeheke had faced a major setback in a battle at his home pa, Te Ahuahu. At least 30 of his people were left dead or injured and Heke himself was wounded. A veteran British officer, Colonel Henry Despard, had recently arrived in Aotearoa and was keen to capitalise on Heke's reversal. He launched a week-long bombardment of Teruki Kawati's newly built pa at Ohiowai. Despard had more than 600 men, five cannons and rocket artillery against 100 or so Māori defenders. He ordered his artillery to spread fire across the pa. The idea was to break the lashings which held its walls together so his troops could simply march up, pull them down and leave the Māori defenceless. But Māori were no newcomers to siege warfare. The thick puriri trunks which made up the wall were sunk metres into the earth, with firing holes screened from view by the pekerangi, a woven flax fence. Inside the wall, Māori had constructed anti-artillery bunkers, connected to a network of trenches. So, while Despard's bombardment must have been terrifying, it did little to weaken the Pa's defences. On the 1st of July, Teruki Kawati led a daring raid out of the Pa, attempting to destroy one of the artillery batteries. The attack was thrown back, and Despard was convinced this must have been an act of desperation from Kawati. Now was his time to strike. But not everyone was on board with this plan. 
Frederick Manning thought it would end in disaster, and so did one of his friends from Hokianga, a Pākehā timber trader named John Webster. Tāmati Wakanene, a senior Ngāpui rangatira supporting the British, shared their concerns. So the trio went up to Despard's tent to talk him out of this attack. Webster later described the interaction like this. Manning, myself and Nene went to interview Despard. We knew well the strength of the power and its construction. Manning was spokesman and commenced with, Sir, we hear that you intend assaulting the power, and we have come to say that unless a breach is made, it will cause great loss of life and will fail. What do you civilians know of the matter? replied Despard. Sir, said Manning, we may not know much, but there is one that apparently knows less, and that is yourself. Despard was enraged by Manning's disrespect and threatened to arrest him. Tamati Wakanene asked Manning to translate what Despard was saying, and when Manning told him, he was disgusted. Tamati Wakanene said, He tangata kumare tene tangata. Despard didn't speak te reo Māori, so Webster said he turned to his interpreter and asked what Nene had said. Despard asked, What did the chief say? The interpreter scratched his head and said, It is not complimentary. But I order you, sir, said Despard. The chief says you are a very stupid person, then replied the interpreter. It was impossible to make any impression on the man who had so many fine young fellows' lives in his hands and he was prepared to sacrifice them through mere obstinacy. A few days later, the assault began. 250 of Despard's best troops charged the par. At first, there was no reaction from its defenders. The troops marched closer, 50 metres away, 40 metres, 30, 20... A volley of musket fire ripped out from the wall and Despard's men started to fall. Standing at a distance, Frederick Manning watched and would later describe what he saw in a book he wrote about the Northern War. The soldiers charged right on and came up to the Pekarangi, which is the outer fence, and began to tear it to pieces with their hands. With one pull, they brought down about five fathoms at the Bakarangi, and then they were before the true fence, which, being made of whole trees placed upright and fixed deeply in the ground, could not be pulled down at all. A handful of Despard's troops found a small breach in the wall and forced their way through, only to find themselves surrounded by dozens of defenders. Within minutes, 50 soldiers were dead, another 70 wounded. The survivors fled back across the plain to friendly lines. The military gets roundly defeated and get made to look really incompetent and stupid. And I think that this is another turning point in Manning's ideas because he he realises that the Māori really are a force to be reckoned with and that in the end there may well be a major conflict and Pākehā are going to have to be on the game and they're going to have to get as much help from sympathetic Māori as possible. That becomes a, you know, one of the themes of his, of his writings from then till the end of his days. He's constantly talking of the need for a a large military action of, of one kind or another before things settle down. Manning also suffered personally from the war, and this may have influenced his feelings as well. Shortly before the Battle of Ohiowai, Manning says his brother in law, Hauraki, was leading a band of Tehikutu which intercepted a larger group of Kapultai warriors. In his book, Manning describes this battle in detail. It was a close fight. And whenever the rifle of Hauraki was hard, a man fell. At one point, Manning says, Hauraki was spotted by a young Te Kapotai chief, Hari. Hari fired at him, and the ball struck him on the breast and passed out at his back, 
but so great was his strength and courage that he did not fall, but took another cap and fixed it, and then fired at the Kabotai chief, and the ball struck him on the side under the armpit and went out at the other armpit. So Harry staggered and fell dead. When Hauraki saw this, he said, I die not unrevenged, and then sank gently to the ground. Manning goes on to describe how Hauraki dragged himself to safety, but eventually died from his wounds. He didn't write about his own feelings about Hauraki's death. Instead, he talked about its impact on Moingaroa, his wife and Hodaki's sister. The sister and also the young wife of Hodaki went in the dark and sat beside the river. They sat weeping silently and spinning a cord to strangle themselves. The flax was wet with their tears and as they did this the moon arose. So when the sister of Hauraki saw the rising moon, she broke silence and lamented aloud, and this was her lament. It is well with thee, O moon, you return from death, spreading your light on the little waves. Men say, behold, the moon reappears, but the dead of this world return no more. Grief and pain spring up in my heart as from a fountain. I hasten to death for relief. Oh, that I might eat those numerous soothsayers who could not foretell his death. Oh, that I might eat the governor for his was the war. At this time, men came who were in search of these women and prevented the sister of Hauraki from killing herself at that time. They watched her for several days, but she died of grief. As we've said, Frederick Manning was prone to romantic language and exaggeration. Things may or may not have happened how he described. One of the strangest things about this book he wrote is that it's written entirely from the perspective of an imaginary Ngāpui chief, which is why he describes Moingaroa as the sister of Hauraki rather than just my wife. Members of Tihigutu I reached out to weren't able to confirm whether these events happened the way Manning described. Although Pākehā historians I've read seem to think the broad strokes are credible. Regardless of the detail, the Northern War cost Frederick Manning two people he seemed to have been very close to. And of course, the loss of Moingaroa was traumatic for their four children, one of whom would write about it later in life. Maria, the second of Manning's children seems to take it to heart the most. She has a lot of really bad dreams in which her mother comes back from the dead and tries to drag her into the grave with her and tries to take her away. And Marie is, you know, terribly affected by these nightmares every night. Some of Manning's Māori neighbours apparently told Maria and her siblings that her dreams were real, that Moingaroa really was trying to communicate with her from beyond the grave. Frederick Manning was extremely alarmed by this, partly probably because it went against his own beliefs. Manning described himself as an atheist. So Manning decides that he needs to get Maria out of this environment. He needs to send her to a European environment where these, these ideas won't be encouraged and you know where she can be looked after perhaps a little bit better than he's able to look after her. So he ships her off to Hobart to his parents. Remember... Manning hadn't told his family about his relationship with Moingaroa or about his children, so this must have come as a major shock to them. They agreed to take Maria in, but the separation was hard on her. She writes home to her father uh, a series of beautiful letters, beautifully written letters, 
terribly sad letters about being separated from him. So we can imagine these personal emotional struggles maybe played a role in Manning's increasing estrangement from the Māori world. But there were probably other factors. As John Nicholson mentioned, after the Northern War, he got more and more anxious about further conflict between Māori and Pākehā. And John thinks another factor may have been economic. Through the 1840s and 50s, thousands of Pākehā colonists would arrive in Aotearoa. By the 1860s, they would outnumber Māori for the first time. And for Frederick Manning, more colonists meant more customers for his timber trading business. In the end, his future and his success really does lie with the Pākehā. And the initial advantages that he had from throwing in his lot with Māori are becoming less and less important. He starts to realise that that in the period leading up to the war, and then the war definitely cements that for him. In fact, Frederick Manning became so engaged with this emerging colonial world that in the early 1860s he considered running for parliament, although he never ended up actually going for it. In Manning's day, the big question among colonial politicians was how to respond to Māori who opposed the sale of more land to Pākehā settlers, especially in Taranaki and Waikato. Broadly speaking, there were two factions among the colonists. The so-called Church Party, which advocated a more diplomatic approach, and the War Party. I think you can probably guess what they advocated. Frederick Manning was firmly in the camp of the War Party. In 1861, he actually wrote to the Native Affairs Minister offering to raise a Ngāpui and Te Rarawa army against Kingitanga. The whole able-bodied population of Hokianga and also the whole Rarawa along the northwest coast as far as Manganui are ready to turn out when called upon by the governor to do so. I could turn out every mother's son of the Hokianga scoundrels myself in eight hours. I asked Te Rarawa Kaumatua Hami Pirapi about this and he reckons this is probably just another boast from Manning. He fancied himself as a mediator like that, I think. Perhaps locally he might be fairly effective, but no, no, he never had that sort of influence, no. It might have been an exaggeration, but Governor Gore Brown liked the sound of it. So he invited Manning and some senior Hokianga rangatira to meet him in Auckland. Unfortunately for Manning, during this trip he got into a series of arguments with the chiefs and some were so offended they just turned around and went home. But he must have been a bit of a firebrand. He never took him long to fall into an argument with the locals. Pretty cantankerous, but I think I was telling you a story about him leaping over his bench and attacking some poor defendant. Manning also fought with his old friend John Webster on this trip, which prompted Webster to write to several MPs. He said... Manning has no influence in Hokianga. It is the nature of the man to boast, and he actually believes his own lies. In any case, Frederick Manning's plans fell to pieces later that year with the arrival of George Grey to replace Brown as governor. Grey actually tried cultivating Manning as an ally, but he didn't have much success. Manning disliked Grey intensely right from the word go, probably because Grey was more interested in talk than he was in war. And by this time, you know, Manning was beginning to think that was unrealistic um, attitude to have. Gray continued to try and pacify Manning and took the attitude that it was better to have Manning on side, on his side, than to make an enemy out of him. So he, he invited Manning to visit. Manning went to Gray's home on Kawo Island in the Hauraki Gulf, which, as we mentioned in a previous episode of Black Sheep, was kind of like a private museum mixed with a zoo. You know, Gray had his collection of 
animals from around New Zealand and the Pacific and South America and Australia, which he showed off to Manning. And Gray asked him if he could have a look around his own area, around the Hokianga, to see if there were any interesting animals that George Gray could have in his zoo. So there was a little period where Manning wrote a series of really mocking letters back to George Gray, pretending to have found, you know, some interesting animal. One of the animals was a, a flying lizard that he called a cow owl, or initially called it a cowie owl, and then he shortened it to, to a cow owl to, just to make the point that he was rubbishing George Gray and mocking him and making fun of him. He hated Gray beyond reason. He just, he, he made a hobby of it, really. He made a hobby of, of George Gray. But while Frederick Manning may have perceived George Gray as a pacifist, that turned out not to be accurate. In 1863, Gray launched his invasion of Waikato, seeking to destroy Māori opposition to land sales by force. In the aftermath, huge areas of land were confiscated. But as legal historian David Williams explains, this only intensified tensions. Confiscation um, brings about uh, quite a good deal of resistance and sense of grievance. And people like Donald McLean said that confiscation wasn't the way to go. What you've got to do is you've got to get a court that's set up which will encourage Māori to come to uh, acquire a title for themselves of the land that's absolutely necessary for their sustenance. And in doing so, we'll extinguish all Māori title completely. All native title will be extinguished. I'll just pause here for a second because there was a term David Williams used which you might not be familiar with. Native title was a British legal concept which basically said that Indigenous people had rights to the land they're living on. These rights were established through Indigenous custom, so in the Māori case, through tikanga, Māori customary law. If you want to understand this in a bit more depth, I'd really recommend reading David's book, Te Koti Tango Whenua. Um, or you can check out the episode of the Aotearoa History Show I did with Marnie Dunlop about the Native Land Court. It's a bit further down this podcast feed. But generally speaking, the idea the Native Affairs Secretary Donald McLean and others had was to get Māori into a courtroom where they could lay out all their rights to land under tikanga. A panel of judges would listen to this evidence and convert it into written documents which established which Māori owned which bits of land and therefore who had the right to sell that land. And then most of the land can be sold either directly to settlers or to the Crown and the Native Land Court did the work of enabling settlers to get hold of, of land which now had a English Law Land Transfer Act title and uh, all Māori rights had been fully extinguished forever. The idea was that this court would prevent disputes over land sales, disputes which had triggered several violent conflicts over the past few decades. Some Māori were cautiously optimistic about this scheme, especially under the original incarnation which called for the court to be headed by senior rangatira. But that idea never came into fruition. Instead, the court was set up with five Pākehā judges, assisted by so-called assessors, who were Māori. When he heard about this court, Frederick Manning figured he was the perfect person to sit on the bench. After all, he argued, he was fluent in te reo and well-versed in tikanga from his years living among Māori. He didn't have any legal training, but that seems not to have been a problem. In 1865, he was named one of the first five judges on the Native Land Court. All five of the first judges that were appointed in 1865, they all served on the court for about 10 years, and, and they set the tone for everything that, that followed. Only one of them was a lawyer, that was Fenton, uh, but he'd, had, he'd done quite a bit of work in Māori districts. He'd been a uh, resident magistrate at Port Waikato and, and so on. The other four Two of them had been surveyors for the New Zealand company. One of them had been a clerk in the Native Department 
The others served in the Navy Department as well. Manning's a bit of an exception. He had no qualifications whatsoever, except for the fact that he knew the natives um, and had uh, married them and had children with them and could speak the language. Um, but that's it. Speaking the language was the main thing. Uh, these were people who could sit in a court hearing and make sure that uh, procedures were observed to uh, achieve the result, which was always intended, which was to relieve Māori of land that which, which was considered unproductive in the eyes of settlers. And of course, there was a lot of land which Pākehā settlers considered to be unproductive, no matter what value it had to Māori. Theoretically, the court was supposed to be a just and orderly system of land exchange. But as Hami Pitipi explains, the court ended up stripping land from Māori even more effectively than war and confiscation. It was a political move to disempower and disembowel us. The biggest uh, sin, if you, if you had to count the sin, was to titleise land right across the country. Because as soon as you got a title, you got a sale. And as they did, they systematically went through and titled every inch of land. And sometimes as soon as a day or two later, the next lot of Pākehā would turn up looking to buy some land. That wasn't a, a loss of 100,000 acres here and there. It was a total country. So we're back where we started, looking at how this court acted to strip land from Māori. As we've seen, one common trick used all over the country was to trap Māori in debt and force land sales to cover that debt. Another was to charge Māori fees to survey their land, which was a requirement of the Native Land Court, and then take a sizeable chunk of that land in payment for the survey. Sometimes people would bring a case to court without the knowledge of other potential claimants, then sell the land out from under them. And there were dozens of other hidden fish hooks and trap doors. In 1876, Hone Kōtuku of Waikato gave this analysis of the court in comparison to the confiscations his iwi had suffered in the wake of the Waikato War. The sword of steel is put out of use, but the sword of deceit is used instead. And I want to linger on this point a bit, because I think when we think about how land was transferred from Māori to Pākehā, our minds often just go to the New Zealand wars. But as David Williams points out, that's only part of the story. I do have some quite strong views on this. Quite a few of the iwi that I've worked with are people who were described by the government as loyal natives. In some ways, the people that had land confiscated had the benefit of a story of serious grievance. Pretty hard to describe what happened to them as anything other than a dreadful calamity. In the case of Kingi Tonga, it's actually held them together. They have these polkai, they go round, and, and they've got a story that resounds with gener- from generation to generation. But what um, Sir Hugh Kafaru wrote in his book about Māori land tenure was that the native land court was the engine of destruction for every tribe everywhere. Engine of destruction was his term. On the land wars is that you have a sort of a picture of bad crown and good Māori. In all of these wars, there are Māori fighting on the crown side. And not a lot of people stand up and talk about their whakapapa to those that fought for the crown. But I think people in the so-called loyal tribes, the people who, for their own interests, wanted to have peace, they wanted to have trade, they wanted to be able to participate in peace and trade, they were the ones that missed out as much as, if not more, than the tribes that fought against the crown. Their loyalty was not rewarded. They were marginalised like all Māori. The extreme case is Ngāti to Orake in Auckland, uh, who finish up with a quarter of an acre of a cemetery uh, by 1951. Uh, so some of the, the, the focus on the wars gives an accurate perspective of part of the history, but there are other parts of the history that I think need to be told as well, which is that the Native Land Court was the main instrument which undermined the customary entitlements of all of those that either were neutral in the wars or who actually fought for the Crown because they wanted to bring peace to the land. As for Frederick Manning's own reaction to the court's impact on Māori, 
Well, we're now fully seeing that second side to Manning. A man with deeply negative views of Māori, especially those who resisted colonisation. In 1869, the five judges wrote a bunch of letters to one another reflecting on the operation of the court and the criticisms it had faced for leaving some tribes virtually, if not completely, landless. Frederick Manning's letter was probably the bluntest of all in response to these concerns. It is taken to be a natural consequence of the contact between two races of men that the soil of the country of one shall pass into the hands of the other. The suffering of the losing race appears to me to be equally inevitable and therefore not in any way to be reduced or prevented. John Nicholson says the letters Manning sent to friends and family had a similar tone. His letters are really often very negative about the people who are appearing before him. He clearly knows his stuff. He knows the nature of of the claims that people are making and why they're making them. He understands that he has to listen to the histories, who's had what sort of rights over what sort of period, whose rights are being manufactured, whose rights have some substance. He clearly understands that, but he can't resist this savage and unpleasant commentary on on the way that, you know, Māori are are fighting it out among themselves to get the spoils of of selling their land. You know, that's the the way Manning, Manning sees it. So his letters are full of that. The other thing that they're full of is the physical problems of doing that work. Just to give a taste of those complaints, here's a letter Manning wrote from Waimate in July 1867. I have been in Bedlam for a couple of weeks, but can't say I've been in bed during that time. The weather, the mud, the climbing hills, wading bogs, swimming rivers, and suffering the tortures of Maori litigation and idiotic law. I can't stand it any longer and shall start for Auckland in about ten days. Yours furiously, Frederick Manning. Of course, the Māori litigants were enduring even worse conditions. One of the major problems with the court was that it often forced Māori to travel long distances to attend, often racking up debts to cover food and accommodation. Debts which, you guessed it, often had to be paid in land. And as the American legal scholar Stuart Banner pointed out in his paper on the land court, Manning's negative attitudes almost certainly affected his work as a judge. It is hard to imagine Judge Manning could have put all his disgust for the Maori and his hatred of his own job aside and devoted careful attention to the merits of each claim. Many officials most likely shared his indifference to issues of justice among Maori. For this reason, issues of the greatest importance to the Māori could be decided in the most casual, offhand way. And let's remember, Frederick Manning had no legal training and was in increasingly poor health. But as David Williams explains, the big problem with the Native Land Court wasn't so much the individual racism of judges and officials. He he was just one of... The cogs in the system, in that sense, he, mm. he 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 wasn't terribly famous as a land court judge. He he was just one that did did the job. Was he a good judge? I guess. Well, it depends how you you you, you characterise good. T. W. Lewis, the Under Secretary for Native Affairs, his view was that the role of the court was to get all superfluous land into the hands of settlers. These judges achieved that, so. They were good judges, <laughs> if achieving the colonial project is what you call it. I think you're asking me, were they people that made intelligent assessments of the evidence? Well, they varied quite a lot from that point of view. Often they just dismissed a lot of that evidence. They just said, ah, oh, look, all of these claimants, they're all offering contesting different views. There's no way of working out what the truth of the history is. We'll just go with the most recent conquest. When was the most recent conquest of this block of land? Who made that conquest? They can have the land. 
Uh, so some of it was just purely arbitrary that way, but, but some of the judges did spend a good deal of time trying to assist the customary entitlements. They sat there for days on end to listen to the evidence. They would write judgments. Does that make them good judges? Well, uh, it depends on what you mean by a good judge. Frederick Manning would serve 10 uncomfortable, angry years on the native land court before retiring in 1876 and going back to his home at Ornoke in Hokianga. But work wasn't the only source of his frustrations. He also got into a series of feuds with his children. He was angry his son Hodaki refused to settle down in a government job Manning organised for him. He was annoyed his daughter Mary had married a man across the harbour he didn't approve of. For a while, his best relationship seems to have been with Maria, the daughter he had sent to be raised by his family in Hobart. They got on well when she returned to Hokianga as a young woman, at least for a while. Yeah, sooner or later she falls foul of her father. I'm not quite sure what she's supposed to have done wrong, but he gets pretty angry with her at one stage. He gets pretty angry with all of them. I'm afraid. (laughs) John Nicholson says Manning also increasingly had to contend with the debilitating illness of his eldest daughter, Susan. She was very small and lithe as a a baby and as a child. Um, But as an adult, she developed a disease which involved a sort of progressive paralysis of her spine. She was crippled all of her adult life. She got worse and worse and worse. And at the end of her life, she was the only one still living at Orniki with Frederick. The two of them were living there. He was unwell. He was full of aches and pains. He was sick of life and wanted to go and live in Auckland. So, but he looked after her, fed them as much as he could scrape together because he was having trouble even doing that. Meantime, Mary was busy spreading reports that Manny was mistreating Susan and he was... He was beating her and by this time he was really at war with all of his kids and they, they, were, they were spreading stuff around, which some of which would, may have been true and some of which may have been ma- made up. In the end, Frederick Manning even came to imagine that his kids were plotting to murder him. Eventually he fled to Auckland, leaving Susan in the care of his neighbours. He enjoyed the novelty of life in the city for a while, but getting into his 70s, old age was catching up with him. He develops this sort of little osseous lump in his jaw. The first treatment of it is to have the surgeon cut it out with no anaesthetic, which he describes in in gruesome detail, being held down while this ghastly process went on. He then walks out the front door of his boarding house and and takes a, a big, solid fall onto the footpath breaks a few bones, including his jaw. And then uh, this problem, this lump on his jaw reoccurs. He gets very sick. The Auckland doctors say there's nothing they can do. So he, he jumps on a boat and goes back to England in the hope that he can get treatment. Back in England, they say they can't do anything about it either. And this cancer or infection, you know, eats away at his jaw and his face and drug to the eyeballs, but probably still in in a fair bit of pain and discomfort. Frederick Manning died in England on July 25th, 1883. Per his wishes, his body was shipped back to Aotearoa and buried in Auckland. He left a contradictory legacy. He was born into a family with seemingly progressive, sympathetic attitudes towards Indigenous people, but grew to become an arch-conservative. In his early writings, he railed against the, quote, demons of civilization. Then, later in life, was advocating war against those who resisted those demons. Maybe the most attractive part of his legacy is the two books he wrote about his early life in Hokianga and his experience of the Northern War. They're beautifully written, full of fun and sometimes moving anecdotes. But at the same time, you never know if you can trust them. Manning will be writing in his book romantically about the struggles of the Māori king, and it sounds like he's a real supporter of the kingitanga. But then, almost at exactly the same time, he's writing to the governor, offering to rally troops to fight against the kingitanga. 
some historians, like David Calhoun, have suggested that Manning's books were written the way they were to deliberately exaggerate the incompatibility of the Māori and Pākehā worlds, supporting Manning's arguments for war and confiscation. But other parts do seem to express genuine fondness for Māori people and culture. And John Nicholson, for one, could never bring himself to believe that Manning was always a secret racist in his heart, even in this early period of his life. Maybe the only consistent part of Frederick Manning's character is his tendency to bluster and boast about his own abilities and achievements. Every part of his life, we can go through the things that he said about his family background, things that he said about his abilities in in the timber business. You know, there's an awful lot of stuff that Frederick Manning said that is just nonsense. It was designed to to embellish his public image and, and to make him look more influential, more important, more knowledgeable than he really was. And the ridiculous thing about Manning was that he was actually a very talented person. He was a terrific writer. He obviously had an engaging personality and an ability to get on with people. His talents didn't really need exaggerating, uh, but he spent his whole life trying to exaggerate them. And the things that he did best, he tried, tried to hide. He was embarrassed about his books. There are lots of stories of of book-burning episodes where multiple copies of The War in the North or Old New Zealand would end up on bonfires. And a couple of whole manuscripts for books that he wrote have never seen the light of day because he burnt them. He seems a very insecure person. Very, very insecure, yep. I think that's what it's all hiding. It's There's a deep insecurity under there. Yeah. Huge thanks to my guests, John Nicholson, Harmi Pitipi, and Professor David Williams. John Nicholson's book is White Chief, The Colourful Life and Times of Judge F. E. Manning of the Hokianga. And Professor Williams' book is Te Koti Tango Whenua, and it's a fantastic resource if you want to learn more about the Native Land Court. This is the final episode of Black Sheep for this season. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen and special thanks to those who've got in touch recommending other Black Sheep to look into. And actually an extra special thanks to a few people who've got in touch with tips on the story of Victor Penny. Based on some of those, I'm actually planning another trip to Archives New Zealand to see if I can find anything more about him. As always, if you want to get in contact, you can email me at william.ray at rnz.co.nz. Black Sheep is written and presented by me, William Ray. The executive producer is Tim Watkin and the sound engineer is William Saunders. We had editorial support for this episode from Shannon Honui-Thompson and Justin Gregory. Our voice actors are Peter Hamilton, Julian Wilcox, Tamamudu, John Gerritsen, Simon Dickinson, Phil Pennington and Giles Beckford. Make sure to follow or subscribe to Black Sheep on your favourite podcasting app and you can always find tonnes of other awesome RNZ podcasts. We've got Great stuff coming out all the time. Our Changing World, Voices, Know My Town, Mr. Little Meets Mr. Big, Healthy or Hoax. And, of course, you can also podcast all your favourite radio shows like Morning Report, Checkpoint, Nine to Noon, Media Watch. Anyway, that's all from me this season. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back with another cast of controversial characters sometime in 2024. Inohora. <laughs>